Hi, it's Bob Hoopscher, and this is the Gaining Perspective Podcast, where we bring you insightful conversations with some of the top thought leaders in the investment advisor profession and investment management industry. I am the founder of Advisor Perspectives and a vice chairman of Vetify. The rise in global interest rates is driving a great reset of real estate values, with the ongoing correction in private markets, REITs offer an attractive entry point with valuations at historic lows. In addition, there are a number of factors that favor REITs. Large differences in valuations between public and private real estate markets, while rare, have historically benefited REITs. REITs have historically outperformed the S&P after Fed tightening cycles. REIT sectors are more concentrated in areas with strong secular growth, including senior housing, industrials, data centers, and residential and specialty housing. If the real estate repricing process continues, there will be a wave of consolidation as well-capitalized firms buy attractive properties at steep discounts. And longer-term falling rates combined with an imbalance of supply and demand will be bullish for REIT valuations. My guest today, Rick Romano, is a managing director at PGM Real Estate and head of its global real estate securities business. PGM is the global asset management business of Prudential Financial. So, Rick, let's start off by having you tell me about your career path, what led you to PGM, and more about your role there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me today, Bob. Uh, well, I was an English lit major in undergrad, so you really wouldn't think that this would ultimately be the career path that I ended up in. But I was also an economics minor, and I really ended up liking those classes a lot better. So ultimately ended up getting my CFA, going to grad school at NYU for MBA in finance, and was fortunate enough to get a position in the analyst training program at PGM Real Estate back in the early 90s. And from there, I learned a lot about private equity, real estate, valuation, et cetera, and really liked it. And I liked it because it really provided an opportunity to learn about any different industry and any different geography really across the world. So for example, in Houston, you sort of have to be fluent in the en energy industry. In Silicon Valley, you have to be fluent in the tech industry, New York, the finance industry, and you could apply that across the world. So really an exciting opportunity. I was also sort of fortunate to be starting my career when REITs listed property was really a nascent market. And I was able to take the sort of private real estate knowledge I had learned at PGM's analyst program and transfer over to Rockefeller and Company, the family office of the Rockefellers, and covered REIT markets for them globally. So really an exciting opportunity to get in literally on the ground floor of this emerging industry called the uh, REIT industry. From there, I was able to go back to PGM and on the private equity side, and I was really involved in, um, at the time, again, you know, a bit more nascent real estate property types. So emerging property types, non-core property types. We were in a merchant banking group that was providing growth capital to new areas like student housing, medical office. These were areas that were not big footprints in the real estate market prior to that. So got firsthand knowledge um, in terms of how those companies function and work. And we took controlling interests. We were on the board um, and provided growth capital, looking to take them public, merge them with other entities or sell the assets. And from that, I went back into the listed REIT market. Back in 2005, we formed um, the, the securities group in PGM. I was a co-founder. And using my background on both the listed and private side, we were able to grow this platform significantly over the past 18 years or so. Well, we're going to talk about the listed REIT market. Let's start with some background. Last year was a tough year for REITs. The REIT index was down about 25%. That was its worst performance since 2008, when it was down 41%. Why is now an attractive entry point? Today, there's a really big disconnect between listed real estate pricing and private real estate pricing. It's historically significant. We've really only seen this level of disconnect in pricing between private real estate and listed real estate about three or four times historically. And we looked back and we said, okay, 
if we go back in history and see where these conditions were present in prior prior times, how did listed real estate perform versus private real estate? And the answer is really compelling. Listed real estate on a rolling three-year forward basis at these levels of price discounts to private real estate, on a rolling forward three-year basis, listed real estate has outperformed private real estate by anywhere from 25 percentage points to 50 percentage points. So what you really have today is a really good opportunity to essentially, especially if you're in a private real estate fund, uh, a non-trader REIT, for example, you can sell at retail pricing levels and buy into the listed REIT market at wholesale pricing levels. We're talking about 20% discounts to private real estate value, 25% discounts. Um, this leads to, we've seen this movie before, it typically leads to M&A, consolidation, um, and uh, particularly a good time historically to be involved. Let's look at the economic backdrop as well. Rates have been rising steadily over the last year or so. It looks like the Fed is going to pause its rate hiking cycle. How does that impact REITs? Yeah, so this is part of the reason why in 2022, we did see the REIT market down 25%. We had an unprecedented central bank reaction to inflation, where we had 500 basis points, 400 basis point types type uh, in interest rate hikes globally, and uh, that weighed on REIT shares, and it really weighed on any REIT shares that had a high cash flow multiple. So similar to what we saw in the equity market, where you saw any any company that had a high cash flow multiple, high PE multiple in 2022 under underperformed. That was also the case in REITs. So areas like industrial, which had good fundamentals, apartments, really strong fundamentals, double digit type rent growth, didn't matter. What you saw was uh, it had a low cap rate or high PE multiple, and as a result, underperformed because investors were concerned about where do interest rates stabilize? How do I underwrite real estate if I don't know where the base rate is gonna stabilize? And how do I assign a risk premium if I'm unsure about that? And the other part of the equation was we didn't know and we still don't know, is it going to be a recession, a soft landing, a hard landing? So investors were really looking for answers to those questions. And we didn't really get the answers in 2022. We're getting closer to the answers today. In fact, you could argue that we are close to the end of the Fed tightening cycle. And what does that mean historically for REITs, for listed REITs? When we've seen periods where the Fed rate hikes stop, again, on a roll forward basis, on a 12-month forward basis, we've seen REITs outperform listed equities, general equities, by about 500 basis points. And the nominal returns are really quite strong. So 19% nominal returns on a 12-month forward, forward basis after the end of Fed rate hike cycles versus 14 for the S&P 500. So again, you've got two really strong tailwinds here. One is valuation versus private real estate. Two is the end of the Fed rate hike cycles are very positive for REITs going forward. The lower rates are a, a strong tailwind to the REIT market. What about inflation? Uh, we've seen inflation come down uh, over the course of this year. Where do you see that uh, playing into the REIT market? Yeah, we've really seen inflation, uh, what, what the Fed is doing has worked, right? We've seen inflation come down significantly in 2023 to a level that is sort of in the sweet spot for REITs. When you look back historically at inflation levels of three to 4%, that's been sort of the sweet spot of REIT performance relative to general equities and relative to bonds. And, you know, REITs do benefit a little bit from some inflation, right? The real benign inflation periods don't necessarily um, result in big rent increases. When you think about how these leases are structured in many cases, they have built-in CPI escalators. So in other words, each year the rent increases by the CPI index. So when you look at that, um, you do have very much built-in inflation protection for a lot of these companies, a lot of these property types within REITs, number one. 
And then the other thing that happens in periods of high inflation or slightly elevated inflation is that construction costs go up significantly. If anybody's been remodeling their house or building a house, you're well aware of you know, the price increases that are going on from a construction cost perspective. What does that do? What does that mean for commercial real estate? It means that developers need higher rents to justify new development, to get financing for new development. That's great for existing landlords because as inflation picks up on the construction side, landlords uh, don't have to worry as much about supply so they can increase existing rents at a higher rate. So really elevated infl inflation or slightly elevated inflation is typically a very good environment for REITs historically. Where are you seeing the best REIT opportunities? Which sectors are most attractive? We're seeing really good opportunities in some of the non-core real estate areas. So I would describe these areas as really having secular tailwinds and also being a bit immune to some of the cyclical risks that are out there today. So what, what do I mean by that? Secular tailwinds are things like demographic growth. So think about assisted living and healthcare real estate as an example. You've got an aging population. The silver tsunami is real. You've got um, the baby boomers are into their 80s now and will be in that sort of peak um, period for assisted living facilities. And, and a lot of these admits are needs-based, that there really is not an alternative, that at some point people need the care level that is provided at these facilities. So you have defensive demand backed by demographics. And what you have today, particularly in assisted living, is we're still coming off of COVID occupancy levels that were quite low because during COVID, a lot of people either couldn't get admitted to assisted living or um, didn't want to be in that environment because at times they would be shut down for new admits and visitations. So now all of that demand is coming back. So we're still about 500 basis points below 2019 occupancy levels for assisted living and with that gap closing every single day. And then when you think about the tenants in assist assisted living, the tenants are generally, you know, getting their income from fixed income investments or social security. And with the inflation that we've seen in 2022, what that meant was they had very big income boosts. Social security had a 9% income boost last year. Um, if they're invested in treasuries, they're getting 5% on their treasuries. So they, they have income growth, the tenants, that they haven't experienced in several years. And all that means is that landlords can have pricing power because they can increase rents 5%, 9%, and not really impact the affordability of the tenant. And combine that with what was, I would say, a headwind in 2022, which was you mentioned inflation before. One of the key areas we saw inflation that could negatively impact real estate is on the wage labor side, particularly healthcare workers. So healthcare worker wage inflation was running double digits last year. That is like all inflation reversing out this year and is normalizing. So you get this tailwind on the top line for assisted living, meaning revenue growth in terms of occupancy gains, uh, rent growth, and then you combine that with this softening of expenses on a relative basis. What does all that mean for net income growth? 15 to 20% same store NOI growth for assisted living real estate. Really hard to find that anywhere else in the market. Forget about real estate, just really anywhere else in the market. Um, so really good opportunity there. And then the other area that I would say is very attractive right now again, sort of in this non-core theme, secular demand drivers, is data centers. Data centers underperformed significantly in 2020, 2022. And, and this is technology real estate. These are facilities that essentially own, they house servers. The tenants are essentially servers <laughs> and there's no real, you know, there's some people's security, things like that in the buildings, but not, not much of a physical presence. And this area had really benefited from work from home. So you saw all the streaming services grow, but also now the next leg, after we've seen this correction in pricing and data centers occur in 2022, we see a good valuation entry point.
But also the next leg is really artificial intelligence. You've heard companies like NVIDIA talk about this on their conference calls. That's driving demand for data centers. We're seeing it in real time. So really accelerated demand that really is not going to be very sensitive to the general economic environment. So those are the types of opportunities we look for. Defensive demand, insulated from the economic environment, and good earnings growth at a good valuation point. You have a bullish view on assisted living and data centers. I want to ask about one other sector that is, uh, I'm sure, of interest to our listeners, office REITs. Uh, They seem to still underperform. I'm wondering if that's still a byproduct of the pandemic. And I'm also interested in what your view is of the long-term impact of working from home. I know there's a fear that as companies renew their leases over the next five to 10 years, they're only going to need maybe half as much space. What does that mean for office REITs? That's a great question. And and that's one that is really on the forefront of investors' minds today. I would say that, uh, number one, over the past 18 months or so in listed REITs, we've had a zero position in office REITs in the U.S., And recently, however, once we got some of the regional bank headlines and the impact on the office REITs as a result of the struggles at some of the regional banks, because they could be a tenant or a lender, um, office REITs sold off uh, significantly in June. We tactically did add back to office, but the real key word there is tactical. So we are not long-term believers in office in terms of where the valuations are today, but there's tactical opportunities within the REIT space to generate alpha as opportunities present themselves. Now, this is not going to happen overnight. To your point and your question, these leases are longer-term leases, five years or 10 years. So as they roll over, not only will there be less demand for space, but rents will come down. And so the reality is that nobody really knows how bad it's going to get. If you think about what the new normal is starting to look like for office space in some of the major urban areas, three-day work weeks, the hybrid work model is the standard. Now, that doesn't mean if you're in the office three days a week, you need 40% less space because you know two days out of five is 40%. That's not true. But what it does mean is that probably something like 15 to 20 percent of the office space out there will not be in demand as or use for office space going forward. So that means you have to look at alternative uses, the highest and best use for that land. Is it residential? In most cases right now, yes. But if you retrofit the existing structure, if you're an office landlord and want to do that, There's only about 15% of the space that translates really economically to be able to do a conversion and make economic sense. So you need either cities or uh, state governments or federal governments to come in and subsidize some of these conversions, um, which may happen over time, or you need these to trade down the land value. So the the, the issue here is you've got... um, Leases expiring that, like you said, not, you know, maybe half of those might be filled or three quarters. You've got rents coming down. You've got debt that's coming due that needs to be refinanced. So what we're starting to see, one of the trends is we're seeing some of the office companies um, and private office landlords give back office buildings to the bank and really credible landlords that typically didn't do this historically because that's the best economic decision for them, for their shareholders, et cetera. So um, we think this uh, is going to be a headwind for the next five or 10 years. The good news in in REITs is that this is a very small component of the U.S. REIT market. It's about 3%. It used to be 18% going back several years. Um, And we can be tactical around it. So when there's opportunity that presents itself, we can step in, take advantage, and then step out. We have liquidity, whereas in private real estate, you don't have that tactical component, that liquidity to be able to do that. So if office REITs went from 18 to 3% over the last several years, where did that 15% go? Is it now in the private market? No, really where it went was to some of these non-core property types that I was talking about. So those are growing. So areas like data centers, healthcare, uh, alternative housing, like single family rental, manufactured housing, they are becoming a bigger piece of the listed REIT pie. 
um, self storage is one that's grown a lot over the last 10 years. So as those values and those companies have grown and office hasn't, they've just become a bigger piece of the pie. Uh, you mentioned earlier the substantial difference in valuation between public and private real estate markets. I mentioned that in my introduction as well. How severe is that? And how does that impact REITs? It is really at one of the most severe points that we've seen historically. So think about 20, in the U.S., 20% type discounts to real estate value. Now, it's a little bit hard to get an exact real estate value today because transactions are down because of what's gone on with interest rates and the credit markets. A lot of shops are pencils down and not doing a lot of deals. So you don't have that much transactional evidence. But when you look at where some of the non-traded REITs are marked or some of the private real estate funds are marked, and look at where listed is trading, that discount is 20% plus. And that's historically significant. And what that means is typically the way that gap is closed historically is that private market valuations get marked down to close some of the gap and listed real estate overshoots and tends to rise to close some of the gap. So we expect that to happen in terms of the REIT market. We think it's a great opportunity to buy wholesale in the REIT market versus retail in, in the private market. And there's great opportunity for consolidation, which we've already started to see in consolidation, meaning public to public M&A activity. There's a real big difference between the haves and have nots in the REIT space. The haves have a low cost of capital. They have lower corporate overhead expenses as a percentage of their assets. And they are able to use technology within their platform to drive more cash flow out of, out of an existing piece of real estate. And that means they can go out and acquire targets and really drive earnings per share growth through that acquisition. We've seen that happen three times in the last 18 months. And what's been different about this and what gets us really excited about what we're calling the great consolidation is that you really are having the acquirer, if they're not getting the result they want from the board or management when they approach them about an acquisition, about being taken over, if they're getting a no, they are a bit more willing now to go public with that offer and really put pressure on the boards and management teams by having shareholders reach out to the boards and management teams and saying, why didn't you accept this offer? Um, you know, we look at this as an attractive offer, et cetera, and that's providing impetus for deals to be done. So we think more of that will happen. We also think these cycles have also always ended, when I say cycles, these big disconnects between private and public, they've also ended with public REITs getting privatized. So large private equity firms looking at the REIT market as a shopping list, as a menu of opportunities where real estate is trading below private market value, and those get arbitraged away. They don't last forever, and we'll see that happen as the credit markets begin to open a bit more. Is it mostly a function of the fact that REITs are a liquid public market and private transactions by nature are going to be less frequent and, and just don't take can't keep up with the realities of the market as quickly as, as public REITs? Absolutely. I think there's uh, the price discovery on the private side is a bit more slow because it does rely on transactions and they tend to dry up. And the valuations are appraisal based too, which tend to lag. Whereas in the listed, like you said, there's a market every single day. It's traded every single day, buyers and sellers setting price. And the other thing about listed is there can be a lot of non-real estate investors who are setting the price on the margin. Whereas in a private real estate transaction, you're not going to have a non-real estate investor buy a $50 million apartment building or buy you know, a $100 million shopping center. In the listed market, you could have a generalist fund you know, be the liquidity on the margin and they're setting price. You could have a hedge fund doing that. You could have retail investment community doing that. So that creates opportunity. Um, and that creates this disconnect between values in both private and, and public markets. I want to talk a little bit about the 
REITs that uh, PGIM offers, uh, the PGIM Select Real Estate Fund. So as of the end of June, and we're recording today on August 23rd, but the performance I looked at was as of the end of June of 2023, its return was 4.67% since inception, which was in 2014. And that compares very favorably to 2.56 for the Lipper real estate funds average and 1.75% for the FTSE IPRA NARI developed index. What do you attribute that success to and how are you managing your portfolios in today's environment? I think it's a great time for active management within real estates. And you could see that in terms of the performance dispersion between active, including our fund and the uh, benchmark. And, you know, part of that is um, you've got a big uh, disruption within real estate that you haven't seen before due to technology and how that's creating dispersion in returns across property types. And now more recently within property types. And what do I mean by that? We did see the earliest, you know, disruption that we saw in techno with technology was e-commerce and that negatively affected regional malls within real estate but it positively impacted industrial, last mile industrial. So that shirt that maybe you would go to the mall for 10 years ago now is you know, sitting in a warehouse in a last mile distributor for an industrial REIT and getting delivered to your garage. So that's been the first level of disruption. And that's created dispersion between industrial returns, which have done very well, and regional mall returns, which have done poorly. Work from home negatively impacted office. Right, technology worked during work from home. We were tested in COVID. Nobody knew it was going to work, but it worked. And that benefited data center technology related REITs where streaming service demand went up uh, you know, um, a lot. So um, as you uh, move forward, where we're starting to see that dispersion now is within property types. So those companies that can utilize technology, whether it's using AI to develop better revenue management systems and, and better pricing models, um, to drive more cash flow out of their real estate than a company that doesn't have that technology capability, that's creating dispersion. So really good time to be active. That's part of what's helped us. And being part of a large private real estate institution like PGM really helps us get those insights into what's going on in the market, what's going on in technology today. How does that apply to the REITs? That gives us our information advantage today. So I would say it's um, as an investor, you really don't wanna be penny wise and pound foolish in this space today because there are a lot of active opportunities out there today. If there's one key takeaway that you would like to leave with our audience of financial advisors about the diligence that they should perform on a REIT investment, what would that be? I would say when you're looking at the dividend, I do know a lot of advisors are very much focused on the dividend and the yield. I would want to be comfortable and confident that the REIT has enough cash flow to pay the dividend. Because what we do see is some of these companies will trade at a high dividend yield for a reason. And the reason is it could be a higher cash flow risk. It could be that they're paying out a higher dividend than they're earning in cash flow. We call that monetizing the dividend, meaning borrowing to pay the dividend. So what that means is either that, that dividend is not sustainable, it's going to get cut, or that dividend is not going to grow over time. We'd rather see a healthy company with good balance sheet management, good capital allocation policy that can grow their dividend over time at a level that's above inflation. So we would rather focus on that type of investment than a company that's just trying to show the highest sticker dividend, but isn't really generating the fundamental cash flow to cover that. I think that's something that that's really important to focus on. And what is the dividend yield now on the uh, PGM Select Real Estate Fund? So the of uh, the underlying companies, when you roll them up, uh, the board will set the dividend based on all of that. But uh, when you roll up the companies, it's a 4% plus type dividend yield right now, but there's many companies, high quality companies, that are trading at dividend yields of five plus and even into the six range that we can find. Well, thank you. And we'll include a link for more information about Rick and P. Jim in the notes that accompany this podcast. There'll be a link to the P. Jim Select Real Estate Fund fact sheet 
to the U.S. Real Estate Fund performance metrics and as well as Rick's latest perspectives on REITs. Rick, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I'd just like to thank you, Bob, and Advisor Perspectives and Vetify for having me on this podcast today. You're welcome. And thank you for listening to the Gaining Perspective podcast with Bob Hoopscher today featuring Rick Romano of PGIM. To support our podcast, please share, subscribe, or leave a review to help make our podcast more findable for your friends and colleagues. You can subscribe to Gaining Perspective on your favorite podcasting service. Thank you. <music>